After two long months, I am very excited to present all leeway lore summarized. If you're wondering why it took so long, I'll explain at the end of the video. If you never watched the Mondstadt video, all you need to know is that each character's stories are over a thousand words long, and I'm condensing them down to about a few hundred each. So that's all for the intro, now let's get right into it. Shang Ling is both a chef and waitress at Wanmin Restaurant, which is in Liwei at a place called Chihu Rock. Her cooking skills have granted her the respect of many citizens of Liwei, including her father, the veteran chef, Mao. Shang Ling is prone to destroying walks in all sorts of different ways through her experimental cooking, but her father encourages her creativity instead of condemning it. After all, her reckless and imaginative nature has led to some of her best dishes. From her father, she also learned the most important secret to cooking, passion. It was through passion that her father was able to find some success as a chef during the war between the Lee and U.S. style cuisines. The industry's selfish monopolizing of luxury ingredients like matsutake and crabs impassioned Shangling into traveling the world to learn how to make delicious food from any ingredients. This is why she has made some unconventional dishes, such as Hilatro Club barbecue fish. Sometimes, her eccentric cooking can leave negative side effects on the consumers, such as diarrhea, yet she mysteriously never experiences such effects for herself. Through lots of trial and error at the expense of the taste testers, Xiangling would become especially amazing at creating spicy dishes. One day, when Xiangling was scavenging for violet grass, she got tired and hungry, so she sought refuge in a nearby cave. Inside was a strange looking shrine. She ate a piece of spicy cornbread which she had with her and left the other piece on the shrine, intending to eat it later when she fell asleep. When she woke up, the cornbread was gone, and in its place was a mysterious looking creature. She continued to feed it, and from then on it would follow her around. She named the creature Guoba after her favorite childhood snack. Despite being told many times to stop her infinite hunt for special ingredients, Shangling has never lost her resolve. In fact, the passion of her innocent and persistent heart believing that all ingredients can lead to delicious food was recognized by the gods, granting her a pyrovision. Beto is the captain of the Crux, a crew of pirates known throughout all of Liwei Harbor. Because of her fame, it is only natural that rumors about her would be passed around, such as one that suggests she can slay a formidable sea monster in one hit. Bystanders who overhear such tales brush them off as exaggerations, but those who know Beto understand that such stories hold true. Beto's power is just as great as her reputation, which is why she claims the title of the uncrowned Lord of the Ocean. Liwei Harbor is a place of business, and business is often associated with prioritizing profit over ethics. But Beto and the Crux are solid proof that Liwei is not all about commodifying humanity. During one particularly harsh storm out at sea, Beto noticed a small private boat being tossed around. Not only did she order her crew to rescue them, but she also offered a share of their small supply of food and water. That saved crew became loyal trade partners soon after. Beto has an interesting relationship with the Qi Sing Tianshen, Ningguang. Ningguang emphasizes that she chooses Beto to do her dirty work and not the crux. That said, Beto does not see Ningguang as her boss, but as an equal. Although advisors warn Ningguang that Beto is too volatile, she knows that Beto is the most reliable person in Liwei. Beto also has a strong relationship with Shang Ling. One time after returning from a long voyage, the crux held its customary three-day celebratory banquet. The chef would be the not yet famous Shang Ling. Beto ended up liking her food so much that she insisted the crew refer to the girl as Madame Shang Ling. Shang Ling later would accompany Beto on sailing trips to search for new and exotic seafood ingredients. Liwe and Inazuma share a common saying, its fins formed the ocean deep, its tail the mountains high. The tale reciting how Rex Lapis smited sea monsters like these was legendary in Liwe, so much so that it was Beto's childhood lullaby. On that fateful day though, she sang the song with a different emotion in her heart. Her crew sang along as they sailed towards Haishan, a gigantic dragonfish hybrid. Beto had challenged the creature before and had always failed, but this time, Beto had brought her strongest greatsword with her. After four days of struggle, filled with cannons, harpoons, arrows, and ropes, Beto continued battling Haishan into the night. Because Haishan was stronger at this time, Beto stood cautious on the ship's bow in the freezing wind. She didn't move all night long, and at the crack of dawn, she noticed a change in the sound of the waves. With one almighty strike, she sliced the leviathan's head clean off, a moment she had been waiting to experience since she was nine years old. At this moment, thunder rumbled and a single bolt of purple lightning struck the ocean in front of Beto, granting her an electrovision. Xingqiu is well known within Liwei Harbor for a few things, 
being that he is the second born son of the esteemed Feiyun Commerce Guild, that he is a kind, well-mannered young man, and that he is an excellent student. Sheng Cho is indeed smart, even among other children of the wealthy, but he also enjoys sneaking reads of martial arts novels in his free time. When his older brother asks Sheng Cho why he disappears for hours at a time, he explains that it's simply a needed moment of solitude, which can mean many things. Sometimes it's visits to the Wanwen bookhouse to browse the novels, or going to the Heiyu tea house for a drink, or committing acts of chivalry. This can entail physically fighting bandits and monsters, or using the power of the Feiyun Commerce Guild to pull strings behind the scenes when necessary. Sheng Cho believes that chivalry means to be good and do good without any ulterior motives. So of course, just like in the martial arts novels, Sheng Cho does not reveal his true identity to those he helps. To give Sheng Cho something to do other than read, his father agreed to let him learn martial arts from the Guhua clan. Sheng Cho was surprised to find out, however, that Guhua was a dying art with poor organization and a low budget. Despite this, Sheng Cho excelled at what he was taught and took interest in the program's other tricks like sword swallowing and fire breathing. He decided he would learn everything they had to offer to aid in his chivalrous heroics. On the other side of Sheng Cho's unassuming, refined personality is a boy who is chatty and mischievous. He especially loves messing around with his exorcist friend Chang Yun, like when he claimed he found a haunted house but actually put his own traps inside it. To top it off, he said Chang Yun would owe him for having one of his maids treat Chang Yun's wounds. Sheng Cho once wrote a martial arts novel named A Legend of Sword based on his own experiences. However, publishing houses thought it was too unrealistic and lame. And so, Sheng Cho snuck some privately printed copies onto the shelves of Wanwen Bookstore. It ended up being unsuccessful, but Sheng Cho didn't know that a passing merchant from Inazuma brought it there and it became a huge hit. The Guhua clan has three great secret arts, the light piercer for pole arms, the rain cutter for swords, and the life ender for those who excelled at both. Because of the clan's decline, the arts have been awaiting a successor. Sheng Cho seems to be just that, seeing as he understood the clan's martial principle after only four years of study. He then had a great realization that a vision is an extension of oneself, and that the weapon is an extension of the vision, though it is unknown exactly when or how Sheng Cho received his. The Liyue Qixing controls all of Liyue Harbor's commerce and tends to keep a low profile while doing so, with the exception of Ningguang. The Tian Qin, who built her own wealth from nothing, is known for being an outgoing person, a connoisseur of desserts, a friend to Liyue's children, and an excellent merchant in her own right. It seems like Ningguang is somehow able to eavesdrop on every conversation in Liyue with how aware she is of everything that happens, but it's actually Liyue's children who play on the streets that do it for her. In exchange for information, she provides many delicious treats, and Ningguang is able to cross-reference with other sources so that nothing is kept secret from her. As a businesswoman, she understands the value of reciprocal exchange, which is why she finds it worthwhile to invest time into mingling with the common folk. But on top of that, she genuinely does enjoy seeing the children smile. Ningguang believes that you can never have enough money, but she also sees money as a trophy of hard-won victory and not just social status. Furthermore, part of the money she makes goes directly towards the Liyue Qixing, which stimulates business throughout all of Liyue Harbor. Liyue Harbor's rules were established by Morax, and each Tianchen has made proper amendments to fit the times. Ningguang believes that laws are good for business and keeping order, but Beidou doesn't seem to feel the same way. Beidou was fined every time she smuggled goods, but she just paid it and continued on. Beidou explained that she did it to help her sailors and the poor, so Ningguang eventually gave up on trying to change Beidou's ways. Above Liyue Harbor is the elegant Jade Chamber held afloat by Plostrite. When Ningguang has important business, she and only her three trusted confidants go there. The confidants organize information and hang summaries on the wall, but Ningguang is able to make decisions before they're even done. Afterwards, she shreds everything and tosses it out the window, creating a snowstorm of paper. Whenever merchants see the shredded snow, they know a big change is bound to take place in the business community. Because of her charm and status, Ningguang naturally has many suitors. She does not care for things that are finite though, so she distances herself to keep them away, but leaves them interested for business reasons. Ningguang's true love is her jade chamber, the symbol of wealth, power, and success, which she continues to invest in upgrading. Visions are a complete mystery, but it is known that when a user dies, the vision is left behind with no elemental powers. The only way to resurrect it is the minuscule chance that it resonates with another. When Ningguang found such a husk, she saw a business opportunity, 
However, as she wrote auction plans with one hand, the jewel in the other began to glow with geo energy, much to Ningguang's dismay. Throughout Li Wei's long history, there have always been rumors about evil spirits. Chang Yun belongs to a renowned family of exorcists who fight off such spirits, but he also happened to be born with a constitution of pure Yang spirit. This means that his presence alone will cause any nearby evil spirits to flee. Although initially it seems perfect, Chang Yun believes a true exorcist should use the established methods of charms and swordsmanship. He hopes to one day prove himself to be a professional exorcist through his own strength and not a condition he received by luck. One time, a very wealthy woman was haunted by a spirit whose noisiness would not let her get a good night's rest. Countless exorcists had tried to help and failed until Chong Yun finally arrived. All he did was sit in the middle of the house and suddenly the sounds disappeared. The woman was prepared to pay Chong Yun in overabundance of gold, but Chong Yun simply accepted his normal fee of a few hundred mora with an emotionless face. This incident caused him to gain some fame within Li Wei for being a person with a heart of clear water and a face of ice. Chong Yun's yang energy also affects him in other ways. It makes his body temperature abnormally high, so he stays away from anything that makes him feel even more hot, including spicy food, drinking hot water, wearing heavy clothes, and getting angry. Though, sometimes this mentality can be taken to extremes, like when he stayed inside a frozen lake for a whole day while staking out an evil spirit in Dragonspine. Though he does wish to one day be able to enjoy a nice relaxing hot spring. On one occasion, eating at Wanmin restaurant with his clan, he accidentally ate a small bit of Jeyun chili and became a different person completely. Although he couldn't recall it after, he became super extroverted, chatting with strangers and even tasting their food. He even claimed to have sensed an evil spirit in the restaurant, slapping a charm on Shangling's forehead and chasing her around with his sword. He was very sorry afterwards, paying the damages with a month's savings and giving Shangling a handmade talisman that wards off evil. Shangling never really minded though, because she felt that Chang Yun on that day was his true self with no walls up. Chang Yun's best friend Xing Chou once suggested that instead of trying to suppress his yang energy, maybe Chang Yun should just find a spirit that is immune to it. Xing Chou thinks of all kinds of leads for them to investigate together, ending up with Chang Yun always feeling that his bad luck is to blame for their lack of results. Despite this strange relationship, Xing Chou is always encouraging Chang Yun to push forward, and that's why Chang Yun sees him as a reliable friend. Most customers were very skeptical about Chang Yun's exorcisms, since he wasn't actually doing very much physically. But despite this, his goal of becoming the best exorcist in Li Wei has never wavered. This resolve is likely why he was granted a vision, but thankfully one of Cryo and not Pyro. Chi Chi is a zombie, and because of that, she has a few unique characteristics. She lacks facial expression, has poor memory, cannot further age, and should have a stiff body, but doesn't only because of her strict calisthenics regimen. Gigi can forget a person within three days if she does not consciously reinforce her impressions of them. But she does manage to remember Wang Cheng funeral parlor director Hu Tao, who wants to bury Chi Chi. Chi Chi thinks Hu Tao has a punchable face and hates that she sees it every single day. Chi Chi is a powerful zombie, especially for her size. She is very quick, and when she needs to, she can allow her body to return to an undead state to increase her power even further. Zombies usually require orders from the person who awakens them to act but Chi Chi has never actually been awakened. As such, she is a rare case of a zombie capable of giving herself orders. But when a particularly difficult order is started, like climbing a cliff to pick herbs, she might not be able to do it no matter how much she tries. So, to cancel an order, one must hug Chi Chi from behind and tell her something like, I love you the most. Unfortunately though, Chi Chi's caretaker Baiju never says it with any sincerity. Chi Chi always carries her home and away handbook of practical wisdom for the undead which contains her daily routine, specific orders, as well as techniques for practicing memorization. One can only hope that she never forgets to read this book. Of course, before Chi Chi was a zombie, she was just a normal girl. One day, she was out picking herbs, but accidentally stumbled upon the realm of the Adepti. Injuring her right leg in a fall, she took refuge in a cavern. Unfortunately, she, an innocent mortal, was stuck in the crossfire of a battle between Adepti and demons. As she was about to die, she felt scared. She wanted to live and see her family again. These feelings coalesced into ice as she thought, if only I could freeze time. How wonderful would that be? Just then, a cryovision appeared before her. The Adepti, who had just finished battling, took pity on the young girl, and so each gave her a portion of their strength to revive her. She did come back to life, but the energy also made her go berserk, so Mountain Shaper took it upon himself to seal her within amber. 
Hundreds of years later, she was discovered and was brought to the Wangsheng funeral parlor for burial. But the seal on her had long since lost its power, so at midnight, she broke out and ran to the herb-filled hills she was familiar with. There, she met Baiju, who took her in, but likely only to help with his personal pursuit of eternal life. Compared to most of Liyue Harbor, the Yuheng of the Liyue Qixing, Keqing, has a unique perspective on Morax. As the daughter of an illustrious Liyue family, she knows very well how much influence Rex Lapis has on the people of Liyue. Every year, at the rite of dissension, all of Liyue Harbor relies on Rex Lapis's policies to make business decisions. But Keqing wonders what will become of Liyue if Rex Lapis were to no longer fulfill his duty. And so, Keqing is now a skeptic about everything, down to the very foundation which Liyue's society is built upon. Perhaps to become a strong role model, she works ten times harder than the average person. Not only does she get tasks done quick, but she also makes sure that every minute detail is done perfectly. Unfortunately, this means that assistants cannot keep up with her and tend to quit before three months of employment. Keqing enjoys building a catalog of experiences which help her grow stronger as a person. This, combined with her philosophy of getting work done right by doing it yourself, means that she is no stranger to physical labor. As an added bonus, this helps her become more involved with what happens all around Liwei. After Rex Lapis departed, the Qi Sing and the Eight Trades prepared to establish the new laws. Keqing had been expecting this moment for so long, yet the task was so much more difficult than she had anticipated. Forcing herself to study harder, she had a newfound appreciation for Rex Lapis. After all, both of them only ever wanted what was best for Li Wei. She then realized that on that one rite of dissension, when she publicly stated her doubt of Rex Lapis's permanence, the laugh that he let out was not one of mockery, but of heavy acknowledgement and expectation. She now often thinks to herself, what would Rex Lapis do at a moment such as this? Despite her hardworking nature, Keqing does enjoy the normal hobby of shopping with friends. On one occasion, she noticed a small stall that sold cute Rex Lapis figurines with tiny bodies and big heads. Convincing her friends to go to the silk store on the other side of the street, she quickly purchased the figurine. But when caught in the act, her friends wondered why a Rex Lapis skeptic like her would want such a thing. Embarrassed, she claimed it was for self-reflection. While this was enough to convince them, her whole shelf at home dedicated to Rex Lapis memorabilia suggests otherwise. Keqing once despised her electrovision, feeling that her power was credited to it rather than her own strength. She even tried destroying it in multiple ways, but was always unsuccessful. Not wanting it to fall into the wrong hands, she eventually came to accept it. But she soon came to genuinely appreciate it, stating that the source of power is far less important than the character of its user. Xinyan is a pioneer of rock and roll in Liyue Harbor, though the genre originates from the hydro region of Fontaine. Her nightly performances are made from her efforts alone. She handmade her own guitar, which includes an attached axe blade and her vision, performs on a self-made stage, and plays tunes she composed herself. Just like herself, her songs are bold, defiant, loud, and proud. She and her audience both enjoy forgetting the troubles of life and immersing themselves in the music. Xin Yan's performances have no regard for theatrics. They can happen at any time, anywhere, and anything can be her instrument. But when she gets going, so does her pyro vision. And so the Millilith were forced to stop Xin Yan from performing to protect the public. Because of this, she would sneak around and start performing in the blink of an eye. Many of the Millilith actually ended up becoming loyal fans, and they helped Xin Yan get away with her performances. Eventually, since their efforts were fruitless and no evidence was found that anyone actually got hurt from these performances, they decided it was okay to just keep close observation. Due to Xin Yan's imposing eyes and the stylized stage costume she wears all the time, those in Liwei Harbor happened to fear her. She didn't want to cause trouble and scare others, so she made some attempts to make a change, like relaxing her facial expressions. Unfortunately, these efforts did not see much success. Xin Yan doesn't have many friends, but she was able to find one in Shangling of Wanmin Restaurant. Xin Yan actually enjoys eating Shangling's experimental recipes, citing it as a source of musical inspiration. Growing up in a poor family, Xin Yan despised prejudices. She was never naturally gifted at any feminine arts, like cooking, chores, and needlework. But despite her success as a rock and roll star, she never gave up on these arts, since giving up because you have no talent is itself a prejudiced belief. A fan named Yunjin once visited Xin Yan and was surprised at how well her house was decorated and maintained. Xin Yan was worried that the rift between the rock and roll vibe she has and her tidy reality would off-put fans but their support only grew from it. 
Xinyan also hopes that her songs can prove that prejudices restrict many from achieving their full potential. Xinyan did not see success as a musician when she first started. Sitting on top of Mount Tianheng, she considered going somewhere else where her music would be more appreciated due to the hate she received. But she decided to go with the defiant nature of rock and roll and prove herself worthy. She continued to practice every single day on that mountain, and so she received her pyro vision. That day, her first concert in Liwei Harbor, filled with sparks and explosions, would be the start of her musical journey. The Wangsheng Funeral Parlor has been in business for 77 generations, and its directors are the best of the best when it comes to preparing funerals. That said, current owner Hu Tao focuses only on handling the deaths of mortals. That leaves the send-offs to the Adepti to her trusted friend, Zhang Li. Because few Adepti rarely ever ascend, the knowledge that Zhang Li possesses is very old and obscure. As for his ability to nail every last minute detail for such ceremonies, he chalks it up to having a good memory. He is not just particular about his work though. In fact, it seems he's particular about everything, even the exact way his food is cooked by others. It also seems that Zhang Li is knowledgeable in all sorts of different things, ranging from business to flowers. In Liwei Harbor, haggling prices is a very common practice. But whenever something catches his eye, Zhang Li will purchase it in full with no hesitation. This is a pretty bad habit for someone who always forgets to bring money with him. Somehow though, his bills end up getting paid in one way or another. Zhang Li does understand the value of money and finance, but he doesn't seem to understand the idea of poverty, or perhaps he simply cannot imagine himself being poor. Zhang Li is of course Morax himself, the Geo Archon. Though the people of Liwei prefer to call him Rex Lapis, he has many different titles based on his various accomplishments. This includes the God of Contracts, the God of Commerce, the God of History, the God of the Stove, and the Warrior God. As the founder of Liwei Harbor, nothing is more important to Morax than contracts. A part of everything within the city, they maintain the city's refined and strict foundation. Thus, the Qi Sing makes sure to strongly punish any violators. Loopholes within the law are permissible, but are swiftly amended by the Tian Chen Ningguang, who is jokingly referred to as the Tailor of Liwei. This has been done so many times, however, that the book containing all amendments is 279 pages thick. But no matter how revised mortal laws become, Rex Lapis will always firmly believe that the one who reneges on their words shall suffer the wrath of the rock. Rex Lapis is the most ancient of the seven. As time went on, the title of Archon passed through many hands until only him and the animal Archon Barbados remained from the originals. But he still fondly remembers those original seven and how long, long ago they used to gather in Liwei and share Mondstadt made wine together. Reflecting on how other Archons have come and gone, Rex Lapis eventually came to realize that at some point he too will have finished his duties. The source of Zhang Li's Archon powers, his Gnosis, no longer belongs to him. He gave it away to the Fatui Harbinger, Senora, to fulfill his final contract. The God of Contracts surely made some kind of equivalent exchange, but he gave away what could only be his most prized possession. So that begs the question, exactly what is the Cryo Archon giving in exchange? Ganyu is the secretary of the Yuhai Pavilion. As such, she has the job of calculating data to aid the Qixing in making important decisions, among other things. Each and every day she works, all in the name of fulfilling the contract she signed 3,000 years ago with Rex Lapis. Ganyu is not the secretary of a Liwei Qixing member, but rather the entire organization itself. She has had that role for a long time, while other members came and went. The amount of work she is tasked with has only increased since she has started, maybe even thousandfold, but she is never deterred. When asked about her motivations, she simply said, What I've done is nothing compared to what Rex Lapis has accomplished. Ganyu is extremely reliable, however, because of her eye for extreme perfection, she is prone to getting nervous and occasionally slipping up. On one rite of dissension, the most important event of the year, Ganyu was three minutes late. She was as embarrassed as could be, and apologized profusely. But of course, nobody really minded. Later in private, she was asked if she was exhausted and needed a break from work, but she refused. She never actually ended up revealing the reason why she was late being that she spent two hours making sure her outfit wasn't too similar to what she wore to the last year's rite. Ganyu has witnessed thousands of years of history, but her mindset has never changed. She has always felt like an outcast due to her conflicting human and adeptus halves. The Chilean part of Ganyu makes her feel like she will never fit in, 
but her human side is hopeful that she will. One of Gandhi's qualities that sets her apart from others is her habit of taking afternoon naps. At lunch hour, she will curl up in a bowl and fall asleep on the spot, and it is very difficult to wake her up after. One time, she even woke up and found herself on a cargo wagon in Dihua Marsh. When asked about her horns, she tells people that they are just ornamental heirlooms. She feels that if they knew the truth, they would distance themselves, but also they might want to touch them. Ganyu is also quite conscious about her weight and physique. Despite all Chilins being strict vegetarians, it is easy to get carried away in a place like Liwe, where all food is made to be delicious. She'll never forget that one time during the Archon War, where a monster tried to swallow her but choked to death due to her size. One more of Ganyu's many talents is her knack for gardening. She has handwritten notes with in-depth, organized information about growing flowers. However, when Ganyu moved on to studying vegetables, she realized they would be a cause of temptation. And so, she decided to erase the results of her research. The Chilin are through and through a peaceful race, but they knew they could not stand idly in the face of evil during the Archon Wars. 3,000 years ago, Ganyu aided Morax in the war, and after it was over, she decided she would help humans create their civilization as the secretary of the Liwei Chising. As soon as she made that decision, her cryo vision appeared on her hip. Zhao is a Yaksha one of many beings summoned by Rex Lapis to vanquish the remnants of evil gods after the Archon War. Zhao was one of five who rose up above the rest, but despite having a formidable reputation amongst the Adepti, he is relatively unknown to mortals. This being, who is over 2,000 years old but has the appearance of a young man, fights a constant war against dark forces, not caring about the collateral damage he may cause. Those who know of his existence refer to his experience as the bane of all evil. But no matter how skilled he is, his war will never end, and nobody will ever witness it or thank him for his actions. Xiao's true name is Alatus, and it belonged to him during a time where a cruel god forced him to be their slave. He did many violent actions, all against his will. By chance, Rex Lapis met this god on the battlefield, defeated them, and freed the Yaksha. He bestowed the name Xiao, saying, In the fables of another world, the name Xiao is that of a great spirit who encountered great suffering and hardship. He endured much suffering, as you have. Use this name from now on. Xiao vowed to protect Li Wei to repay his gratitude, but all that was left of Xiao now was the urge to kill and the weight of his sins. With his innocence and gentleness gone, he was nothing but a warrior. Because of his intimidating look, not many care to repay Xiao for his actions. But there is a Qi Seng member who runs a front organization called the Wang Shu Inn, and they know that Xiao seriously loves almond tofu. Not because of the sweet taste, but because its texture reminds him of the dreams he used to devour. Over time, Zhao has been harshly affected by the evil manifestations he fights against. Fragments of the hatred have seeped into Zhao's own soul, accumulating corrosive karmic debt. But no matter how much he builds up, Zhao struggles more with the battle he has with himself. He has no home to return to, no person to find comfort in. But after one exhausted battle, when Zhao fell to the ground in agony, he heard a clear and lovely melody played by a flute. It gave Zhao a sense of protection he hadn't felt since the last time he met one of the seven. All Adepti are known as Mighty and Illuminated Adepti, but what Illumination refers to is the light of their third eye, their vision. Xiao no longer remembers how or when he received his, but what he does remember is the special feeling that overwhelms him every year during the Lantern Rite. Although he hates the celebration because evil spirits always appear during this time, afterwards, watching the lanterns light up the night sky, he feels something. Whether it is loneliness, peace, fear, or something else, he does not know. Hu Tao is the 77th director of the Wangsheng Funeral Parlor. She is known for the two polar opposite sides of her personality. She loves being a playful trickster who always has the strangest ideas of fun, yet when it comes to funeral ceremonies, she shows how dignified and solemn she can really be. The Wangsheng Funeral Parlor is all about giving utmost respect for the end of a person's life. No matter social standing or level of wealth, all deserve a proper ceremony. So naturally, everybody was worried when Hu Tao conducted her first funeral ceremony as a teenager. When she was three years old, she would read classic texts while doing handstands. At six, she would skip class and nap inside coffins. But when she was eight, she began to learn about funeral ceremony etiquette. When it came time to prove herself, Hu Tao demonstrated the depth of her knowledge and how professional she could be. Whether the client wants something more peaceful or something on the lively side, Hu Tao always delivers. But still, one might stumble upon Hu Tao enjoying a four-player card game all by herself. In front of the Ministry of Civil Affairs, there are two lifelike stone lions to symbolize power and authority. 
Hu Tao took interest in them, naming them whiskers and mittens. The ministry guards were shocked at first when they discovered a suspicious Hu Tao washing the statues, but then they were glad that someone else was willing to do their work for them. But eventually, Hu Tao stopped coming, her reasoning being that whiskers and mittens are adults now and can take care of themselves. When Hu Tao first met Chi Chi, she decided she would put her zombie friend to rest and end Chi Chi's eternal suffering. So she kidnapped Chi Chi several times to bury her, but was always unsuccessful due to Baiju's interventions. Chi Chi, however, did not want to die again, and so she began to remember hiding places to stay away from Hu Tao, despite her poor memorization skills. Hu Tao eventually decided to investigate Chi Chi's past and soon felt sorry for her in a different way than before. Thus, her attitude has changed, and she treats Chi Chi as a rare exception. Hu Tao would actually like to be good friends, except that Chi Chi can only remember Hu Tao as that annoying girl who is out to bury her. Surprisingly, Hu Tao is not best known for her job as director, but for being a great poet. Her hillatune is famous throughout all of Liwei. Lover of literature, Xing Chou wanted to meet the poem's author, and when he did, the two became good friends immediately. Despite there being a stark difference between Xing Chou's traditional style and Hu Tao's abstract, they would often exchange pointers. They also enjoyed friendly poetry battles, even bringing in Chang Yun to serve as a judge. Hu Tao's harmony hexagram hat was passed down from her grandfather, the funeral parlor's 75th director. But since he was a much larger person, Hu Tao had to spend a whole day modifying the hat to fit her own head. Adorned with the funeral parlor's insignia and a hand-picked preserved plum blossom, Hu Tao tells others that the hat has powers to dispel evil. Before Hu Tao's grandfather passed away from illness, he wished for Hu Tao to hold his grand funeral. Only 13 years old at the time, she impressed the undertakers with all her arrangements. But the night after the funeral, she went out in the dead of night alone to Wu Wang Hill. Her destination was the border which separates life and death, in hopes of seeing the spirit of her grandfather one last time. She traveled for two days and waited there for more, never seeing the spirit she wanted. She slowly used up her rations until the spirit of a little old woman told her that she should return home before the spirit passed into the afterlife. She realized that her grandfather must have passed over the border immediately because he had no regrets in his honest life. As she headed home, she remembered her grandfather's words, live in life, die in death, follow your heart, do what you can. And when she snuck back into her room and unpacked her travel bag, she found a radiant pyro vision, the ultimate recognition of her strength. I did not forget about Child. I'm just exhausted and it's fitting enough to put him in his own separate video since he's not even from Leeway. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed. <laughs> Honestly, I loved reading every single one of these, so definitely go read them if you get the chance. You might have noticed that each character's portion is a bit longer than the ones in the Monstat video, and it's because I had such a hard time cutting stuff out. I have so much respect for the writing and translation teams for providing such entertaining material. As for why this video took so long, basically I made the first one over winter break and it took me the entire week to complete. Also, when I uploaded it, it actually wasn't that successful, so I was pretty demotivated having spent all that time working on it. Then when I continued to make videos, I was trying to be able to put out two videos per week. Both of these things made me not want to make this video at all, but then people actually began watching the Monstat video and ended up really enjoying it. So being on spring break now, I figured it was finally time. I sincerely hope you enjoyed this video and thank you for being patient. For when new characters come out, I do want to go over their lores as they come and then maybe in a long time from now I'll remake the all lores videos. But as always, thank you for watching.